Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, it's great um, being able to, to speak to all of you and share a message with you this morning um, from the comfort of my home. Um, and yeah, the, the times we're in has really um, caused us to, to do things differently, but, but praise God, He's with us. He has blessed us with technology. He has given us the ability to be able to speak to each other and share from His Word, no matter where we are. Um, and things are just like borderless um, at the moment. So. So I, I'm just thankful for God about that. Um, and before I, I share with you what, what I want to share this morning, um, I'd just like us to pray together. Lord, I just uh, I just thank you for this morning, Father God. I just thank you that, that we can speak from your word. I just thank you, Lord, that, that your word has the power to bring clarity, no matter what we're going through. Your word has the power to to bring hope no matter the circumstance your word is the power to 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 give direction lord and we don't know where to go for the god your word is the answer to everything lord and we just thank you lord that we do not need to do anything um out of ourselves lord but that you have already done everything for the god you have already paid the price you have already overcome this world you have already done everything needed for the god for us to be in relationship with you for the god for us to be intimate with you father god you have done it all you have done everything lord and we just thank you for that lord and and i just ask lord in jesus name this morning lord that you will speak to us lord that you will speak to me through the sermon that you will speak to every one of us through the sermon lord and and not through my words lord but but through your spirit in jesus name i declare that lord that not one word will be from me lord but it will be from your spirit lord i just thank you that even this morning you will speak into people's hearts, Lord, things that I do not even say this, this morning, Lord, things that I do not even convey, Lord, you will speak and you will plant it in people's spirits. And I just declare that in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So thank you guys for being here and for being able to listen to this message that you've selected click play or that you decided to, to come to someone's house this morning and to listen to this message. Um, I honor you for that. You've made the right decision. Um, if we were at church now, I would have said you have, you're at the best place you can be. Um, and, and wherever you are, whether you're at home or whether you're in your living room or whether you're, um, or wherever you are in the car and you're listening to this message, I'm telling you that you made the right decision to listen to something from God's word. Um, so, so I'm excited for what God wants to do in your life this morning and what he wants to plant in your heart this morning. So just to introduce myself, um, my name is Donny Griev. Um, I am from Wolfish Bay. Um, I've been living in Wolfish Bay since the age of two years old. And when I was two years old, my, my parents moved to Wolfish Bay from Pretoria, South Africa. Um, I went to school here until, the grade, until grade 10. And then I was in South Africa for two years. And thereafter, I was studying in South Africa for four years. And ever since, I've been back in Wolfish Bay again. I think I've been, I think I'm in Wolfish Bay now um since returning from south africa for the fourth for my fourth year um so yeah this morning um before i start the sermon um i would like you to think of something in your life that that was taken away something that was removed something that that you used to have and it was removed and it was taken away maybe it, maybe it was temporarily maybe it was just for a season maybe it was for a year uh, maybe it's permanent maybe it's something you used to do and it's just removed and and you've never returned to it again um something simple in my life is about two years ago um so i'm a squash player and two years ago i i experienced god asking me to to not play squash um indefinitely at that stage um, i didn't have a time on it god didn't give me a time for it but but it ended up being for approximately one year where god said donny i don't want you to play any squash and and then i started playing again so for a year's time god removed something from my life and he's like Shh, i'm taking this away um not because i did something bad not because i did something wrong not because this or that god just wanted to take something away for a season because he had a specific task and a specific goal with it so this morning I'm gonna I'm gonna speak a bit about, about about seasons of pruning, seasons of of pruning where we go to to times and situations in our life where where we are pruned and what what is pruning? That sounds so way weird. It sounds so strange. Um, and I also want to talk about temptation and sin because because I think sometimes we 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 ex we we confuse those two. It's like oh God is pruning me, um, but actually. You're being tempted and, and is it God that's tempting me or am I tempting myself and, and what is this? What is this all about? 
So I want to speak about that and, and I'm going to start off with, with talking about um, temptation. But, but, let, but let's just give a, a base ground of, of what the difference between temptation and pruning is before we go into the scriptures in detail. So, so temptation is, is, is a desire or a want to sin. It's something that com comes in front of you and you're like, Shh, this is a temptation in front of me. I can choose to sin right now or I can choose to against it. I can choose God instead of the sin. So that is the temptation. It's something that's put in front of you, but the temptation itself is not sin. It's when you choose to fall to the temptation that you end up sinning. And where pruning is, is where God says, but when you bear fruit, I will prune you so that you can bear more fruit. Um, where, where Jesus speaks about he is the vine and we are the branches. And, and when we are in him, we will bear good fruits because when we bear fruit, we give glory to our father, which is God. Um, so what is the difference between the two? Because because if I look in my past week, <laughs> up until I was preparing for the sermon, I was under the impression that God is pruning me. God is busy pruning me because of this 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 week that's passed, literally from Sunday to today, um, I've had to say sorry to so many people. It's the most I've had to say sorry to people in a week's time in a very long time. Um, and and I was like, oh God. You're bringing all this filth, all this filth in my heart. You bring to the surface, and you're busy pruning me, and you're busy cleansing me. Um, and while I was preparing the sermon, God's like, Shh, sh "This is not pruning. This is because of your lack of intimacy. Because of your lack of intimacy with me, you are sinning. And because you are sinning, you are hurting other people. So it's not because you are being pruned. It's because you have a lack of intimacy with me. And I'm like, eh, that is so true. <laughs> um, so this past week." And I want to say that also for just as a as a like a base for the sermon as well is I'm not speaking at anyone. I'm speaking with all of you. I'm going through this thing and this is something that I'm going through in my life. Um, so I'm not speaking down at anyone. Um, we're speaking together. We're talking with each other. Um, so please just just hear me out this morning. So so let's start with with temptation. So temptation is a scripture that I'd like us to read in James one verse twelve to. 15. So that scripture says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when, he has, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and entices. Then, when desire has, be, has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So, do you guys, what, what is just so, so, so strong for me in that, mess, in that scripture is, God does not tempt. God does not tempt anyone god cannot tempt you for he is pure he does not put something in front of you to see whether you're going to choose him do you guys see that there is something that 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 is so real for us in our lives and me this past week i'm like god are you pruning me god are you making me more what are you doing why am i sinning so much why am i getting angry so much why am i being so rude to people why do I have to say sorry so much? Because every time I'm I'm rude and I send to someone, I'm like, ah, oh, Danny, you have to phone them, you have to say sorry, go say sorry, and it happened so much this week, um, and and I'm like, oh, why are you doing this to me, God? Why am I going through this? And then the scripture is like, God is not tempting you. You are being tempted by your own desires. It is when you have a lack of intimacy. It's when you are drawing away to your own desires and not to the will of God. When those two paths are leading into different directions that you are being tempted. Do not say that it's God. It is your own desires. So then we see that it, it starts as a desire and that is that is what happens with all temptations and almost all sin. Is it starts with the heart. It starts with something in your heart and that's where where, where the scripture says in the Old Testament it was do not commit adultery. In the New Testament it says, I do not want you, when you lust at a woman you have already committed adultery. Why? Because Jesus is saying, I'm circumcising your heart. It's in your desire that it starts. You start with a desire to, 
to look at someone else. You start with a desire to, to be angry at someone and then it ends up being murder. It doesn't, you don't wake up one morning and you decide to murder someone. You wake up with anger, repeated anger. And anger will one day come forth to be murder. And murder is now an extreme example. But, but I want you to, to take that as an example for whatever is applicable to your life. So it starts in the heart. It starts with me being frustrated with someone. It starts with me being frustrated about, about a situation and something that I haven't brought to the light and something that I haven't sp spoken to God about. And then something small happens and what? Whoop! Explosion. It all comes out all of a sudden. Because my heart was not clean. My heart was not pure. My heart was not open. And because my heart was, was drawn away by my own desires, it got conceived to sin. And therefore I sinned and I fell to the temptation. So God does not tempt. God cannot tempt anyone. But God does say, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when temptation comes and when you are drawn away by your desires and you choose against it, blessed are you. Blessed are you when you choose away temptation. And I want to say as well, blessed are you when you repent from your sin. Blessed are you when you say, God, I have sinned, I am a sinner, and I am sorry. Lord, please forgive me. For God loves a broken heart. A broken heart, broken before him, saying, Lord, I cannot on my own, but I can with you. And that should be our attitude towards sin and our attitude to, towards, towards temptation. But, and then a, a scripture that's really been been prompted and, and that's been brought up in, in a lot of conversations I've had with people the last, the last while. And, and it's, it speaks about the fear of the Lord because, because sometimes we're also like, man, am I always going to fall? Am I always going to fall short? Am I always going to sin? What, what can I do to not sin? What can I do to, to help myself to not constantly fall short of God? And, and yes, we're always going to fall short of God. Yes, we are sinners. And I'm not taking away from that, but still there's a desire in my heart to say, Lord, I wish not to sin. Lord, I wish not to live an unholy life. I wish to live a life that is pleasing unto you. I wish to live a life that is pleasing unto your name. I wish to, to represent you well to this earth. I, I wish to represent you and be an ambassador for Christ. I wish to shine your light, Lord, that people will see you and that your name may be glorified. Not that I be glorified, but you, Lord Jesus. And I believe that is the heart for the church and the heart for the church of Christ. That we should live lives pointing towards God. It's back to the, to the scripture that's been coming up and it's, it's Proverbs 16 verse 6. And it says, in mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord... One departs from evil. By the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. And, and this is a concept that, that is not often spoken about in church. It's something that's not often brought up in conversations. It's something that's not often talked about at small group. Um, it's something that we, that we don't like talking about and understand why. Um, I understand why we don't like talking about the fear of the Lord. I think it's because we, we live on an earth where... where where we have an unhealthy concept of fear because we see God as our father and and we might be living we not might not have had a good earthly father and our earthly father we might have feared him in an health unhealthy way and now when someone says but you need to fear God you you, you connect that same image that, that same fear you had towards your earthly father you are thinking you need to have God the father which is totally different um, but that does not excuse us not talking about that just because we had lives or, or we had a past where God, where God the Father was not represented well by, by our earthly father. So uh, I just want us to say, and I want to, want to say this, is, is that the fear of the Lord drives out all other fears. If you have a fear in your life, a fear of heights, a fear of failure, a fear of, a fear of being alone, Whatever it may be, I want to tell you, replace it with the fear of the Lord. Because the fear of the Lord will drive out all other fears. The fear of the Lord, as that scripture says, the fear of the Lord. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. When we 
live lives with reverence towards God. And we're like, God, you're so, so almighty. And I just want you there where you are, just close your eyes. Just close your eyes and I just see God in his greatness. Just see God in, in how great and how magnificent he is. The God that spoke and the world is still catching up. That God that knows the hairs on the head of everyone on this earth. That God that knows the lives of every person that has lived before us. That is living now and that is still to live. The God that is far beyond anything we can ever imagine. Just imagine how great God is. And God, I just ask that you will show something new to each of us. Just show us new, something new of how great you are. How big you are. Amen. You can open your eyes. And I want you to see when, if you think of that which you just saw, of how great and how magnificent God is. And you have that idea in your head. Like, that is God. That is how great God is. And then you think of something of evil that you know this, this, this pleases God. No one needs to convince you what is displeasing to God. In your heart, you know what is currently displeasing God in your life. And then you compare the two to each other. God, almighty, magnificent, honorable, holy God, ruler of heavens. And that thing that, that is evil in your heart. When we have a fear of the Lord and a healthy concept and reverence towards the greatness and magnificence of who God is. And we live lives that is desire that we have a desire to please Him, we will depart from evil. Because our desire to please a holy God is stronger than our desire. To please ourselves in sin. As we said, no one is tempted by God. We are tempted by our own selfish desires. So now, so now we're speaking about temptation and you're like, Donnie, I thought you were speaking about pruning. We're just talking about temptation and sin. Um, so what's the difference? What's the difference between pruning and being tempted? Because now we're saying, okay, we have a heart for God. We want to have a heart. We, we want to please God and we want to seek God. God with everything in us and we do not want to sin. We do not want to live lives. And you're like, yes, Donnie, that is me, Donnie. That is what I have done. But, but Donnie, I've gone through times in my life where I have not sinned. I have not sinned, yet bad things are happening to me. I have not sinned, yet things are still happening in my life that I do not like. I have not sinned, yet I have lost my job. I have not sinned, yet I have hurt my leg and I cannot play rugby this year. I have not sinned and things are happening to me that is not in line with what I saw in my life or my plan for my life. So what now? Why is God doing this to me? Is he tempting me? Is he tempting me to choose against him? What is he busy with? And I want us to read John 15, verse 1 to 4. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So you see this concept that God is introducing to his disciples in the scripture. Is he saying, if you bear fruit, I am going to prune you so that you can bear more fruit. What is our connectation with pruning? I can tell you mine is negative. 
<laughs> when I hear God is going to prune me, I'm like, oh no, I'm not looking forward to this time. I'm not looking forward to this season. I personally do not go in the mornings on my knees and I ask God to prune me. <laughs> we, we much rather pray, pray prayers of blessing and prayers of guidance and prayers of comfort and prayers of love. And, and very few times we actually pray prayers of pruning and we're like, God, prune me. So I want to introduce to you and I want to explain this morning that pruning is positive. Pruning is a gift. To be pruned by God is a gift from God. It's, it's not as a result of your sin. It's a result of you living a life that is bearing fruit. God says, when you bear fruit, I will prune you so that you can bear more fruit. So do we see that there's a clear distinction between temptation and sin that is from us and our own desires. Therefore, we are not living holy lives and lives that is, that is desirable for God. Where pruning is a life living in obedience to Christ, intimate with Christ, bearing fruit for God, being an ambassador for Him. Yet He says, now I'm going to prune you so that you can bear more fruit. So I want us to see that there's a clear distinction between the two. The one is because of our own selfish nature. The other one is because of God and God wanting us to represent him better to the world. So we see there's a clear distinction between the two, between temptation and between pruning. So usually pruning can have, can have many sorts and, and, and functions and, and how it looks. And, and it will look, look, look different to each of us in different seasons. It might be a loss of a job. It might be a loss of finances. It might be a loss of influence. It might be something. It's something that is cut off. It's something that's removed. As we asked in the beginning of the sermon in the introduction is what, is, what has been removed from your life in the past? What have you lost? What has been taken away? And that is God. If you take a tree that is bearing fruit and you're like, oh, this is growth and it's green, but I need to cut this piece off because it doesn't look that nice. Or if I cut this off, it's going to be able to bear more fruit. So that is exactly what God does. He's not cutting that branch off because it's dead. The dead branches are removed. They are not pruned. If you are not bearing fruit, God removes the branch and you are thrown into the fire. So this is not a dead branch that is not bearing fruit. This is a branch bearing fruit that is pruned so that it can bear more fruit. So this is a positive concept in our lives that God is doing and that God does in our lives. So pruning needs to take place in order for us to bear fruit in the next season. Otherwise the fruit, I'm just seeing this image of a branch that is, that is not capable of carrying all the fruit on it. And it just starts to fall and later breaks off because the branch is not strong enough to carry the fruit that it's carrying. And I think that is what God does. He prunes us so that we are stronger. So that the branch is stronger and that it can carry more fruit. So what is the temptation while we are being pruned? See, here they come together. The temptation while you are being pruned is that you would wish the season to pass. <laughs> and man, I do that all the time. If I look back at the year that I didn't play squash, there were so many times where I'm just like, God, I wish I could end. Yeah, during that year, all of a sudden, everyone started playing squash and talking about squash. And I'm like, Ugh, just talk. I wish I could play. And in my heart, I'm like, Lord, I wish I can play squash. Lord, can't I stop playing again? And that's the temptation. The temptation while you're being pruned is that you would wish the season to pass. And I believe that is not what God wants us to do. I believe that while you're in a season of pruning, we must say, Lord, prune me as you wish. Lord, prune me as much as you like. This is for your glory and for you alone. This life I live is for you and not for myself. This life is about you and not about me. So in the pruning, I want us to be aware and be careful towards the temptation of wishing the season to pass. Endure the season. Become strong. Have endurance. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And you will be able to endure whatever God brings to you and across your path. See, and now, now I want us to, to see another scripture where 
where, where the scripture might be very strange to some of us. And it's a scripture that, that I often just read over. I'm like, oh, this doesn't make sense to me. Um, I, might, I must be misunderstanding this. Um, and it's a scripture of Jesus and Jesus' life. Um, where, where, where Jesus learned obedience to the things he suffered. Woo! Crazy. Crazy. Jesus Christ learned obedience to the things he suffered. So let's, let's read that. Hebrews 5, verse 7 to 9. Who, in the days of his flesh, if you want to read the scriptures before that, you are welcome. Um, I, I'm not going to read through all that before this because I don't believe it's changing the context of the scripture. Um, I, I usually don't like starting in the middle of a verse or in the middle of a chapter. Um, but for the sake of time, we're not going to read the entire part now. So from verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with venient cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Jesus was heard because of his godly fear. Remember what we said now about the fear of the Lord. The, through the fear of the Lord, we depart from evil. Jesus was heard because of his godly fear. Jesus Christ had the fear of the Lord. He had a fear of the Lord. Though he was a son, Yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. Crazy statement. Crazy scripture. Scripture that we don't often talk about. Scripture that maybe makes you feel strange and you're like, ah. Oh, this is weird. This is not something that I've heard. So Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. So we need to talk about this. We need to talk about the scripture and these things in scripture that we often fly past because it's not a feel-good message. And then when the, when the season of, of pruning comes, you're so confused. The season of pruning comes and you're like, what is going on? I've been faithful, Lord. I've been faithful. I've been giving my tithe. I've been serving at work. I've been doing everything I can. I'm doing an excellent job at work. Lord, now I lose my job. Lord, now you take away this. Lord, now you take away influence. Lord, now you take away whatever you wanted to take away in your life. And it leaves us so confused because we don't often talk about this. God is learning us obedience through the things we suffer. But it's, it is temporary. But it might return later. But God is learning obedience. God is pruning us. God is teaching us to be stronger in Him. He's teaching us to have faith in Him. He's teaching us to love Him no matter what we go through. We are loving Him not because of what He can give us but because of who He is. And that is what God's, God wants to be in our heart, is a reverence for God and say, God, I do not know why this is happening to me, but I trust you. Lord, I don't know why this is happening, but I believe in you. Lord, I believe in you and Lord, I love you. I will not allow this to make me depart from your love. I love you with everything in my heart, Lord. And whether you give or whether you take away, I will keep on loving you. And I declare that in Jesus' name. Because, because God is the potter and we are the clay. Isaiah 64 verse 8 says, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. And all we are, the work of your hand. And this is a nice scripture to say, but we are the clay and God is the potter and he is molding and mending us. But when God is molding and mending us, it is sore sometimes. It is suffering. It is pruning. You see, God usually does not prune us when it's going well. Because when it's going well, more often than not, we don't turn to God. And we don't look to God. We look to ourselves because we think we are capable by our own. But God is saying, I am the potter. You are the clay. Now I will make you and mend you and mold you. 
so that you can represent me as you are supposed to. And, and I just feel like someone also needs to hear that, that God is going to mend you as you were meant to be. I feel like there are some people that have been comparing themselves to other people. And God wants to stop that. From this morning, I, I just feel like God is saying, no longer will you be compared to that of other people. But you will be compared to me and my to your intimacy with me. We just declare, Lord, in Jesus' name that the line is broken right now. That people will not be compared to the pots they see around them. They will not be compared to the pots that they see around them, Father God. But they will live a life of obedience to you, saying that, Lord, make me as I should be. Make me as you have desired me to be. Whatever pot you wish me to be, however you wish me to be and how I should look, that is what I will be. Not what other people place on me, not what other people expect of me. We just declare that the expectations of people will fall down in Jesus' name. Expectations that other people have placed on them that was not from you. I just declare that that will be broken right now. It's broken right now. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. And if this was you and if this word was from you, um, maybe this is the only thing you had to hear this morning. That Jesus wants you to be you. And he doesn't want you to be like the other pots. I would like you to share that to someone this morning. Maybe you're watching the sermon in the evening. Send someone a WhatsApp. Send someone an SMS. Um, just share with someone what God has just revealed to you. And what God has just told you. Because I, sometimes it's not a quick fix. It's something that you need to walk through. Um, that someone needs to speak with you about. And, and, and just help keep accountable and walk through this process. Um, because we see also in that scripture where Jesus says... Although he was a son, he was taught obedience to the things he suffered. But he was a son. He was a son and a daughter that is pleased by God. And we do not do all these things because we want to please God. We are already accepted by him. And we are already loved by him. But from that place of love and from that place of intimacy, we go and we start living lives that represent him. We start living lives that, that show the world and that point the world towards him. So... Yeah, bless, bless you, whoever this, that word was for. Um, where was I? Okay. Sorry, so back back to the sermon. <laughs> um, so, all this might seem very, very uncomfortable and very strange and very weird. And, and, and it might be a strange concept to you to say, but God prunes me. Um, God, God wants to lead me. God, God, Jesus learned obedience to the things that he suffered. And if this is not feeling nice and this is not feeling comfortable and, and you maybe want to resist and there's something in your heart that's resisting this, then I want to ask you the question, have you died? It's the question I'm asking myself. Donnie, have you died to yourself? Have you really picked up your cross, denied yourself and decided to follow Jesus? Or is it just a nice concept? Is it just a nice scripture? Or is it something that is evident in your life? Is it something that is a condition of your heart? That you really have a heart that says, Lord, as you wish. Lord, whatever you seek, whatever you want, whatever your will is, let it be. Let it be done, Lord. Whether you give or whether you take away, doesn't matter. Your kingdom come on this earth as it is in heaven. Use me as you wish, and not as I wish and how I think I should be used. So God is inviting us. This might seem like a hard sermon or, or a hard word, but, but I see it as an invitation. I see it as an invitation that God is saying, My church, my son, my daughter, I am inviting you. I am inviting you to join me. I'm inviting you to intimacy. I'm inviting you to love. I'm inviting you to joy. I'm inviting you to peace. I'm inviting you to a relationship with me where you can eat and feast in the presence of your enemies. I'm inviting you to this. Don't resist. Don't resist. You see, when, when Jesus died on the cross, and in Matthew 27, verse 50 to 51, he said, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, 
and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, this is after Jesus' spirit went, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So what that symbolizes and that would mean, just to give some context, is in the Old Testament, the veil's function was, was to separate the, se separate, <laughs> separate the Israelites from the direct presence of God. So you had this veil. Let's make it like that. So you had this veil. On this side was the Israelites. On that side was God's direct presence. And then God comes in the New Testament when Jesus died and he says, There is no veil. The veil has been torn in half. Inviting us to say, Come. Come into my presence. Come to me. Come to me. I want you to be with me. I want you to live with me. I want you to represent me. I want you to bear fruit. I want you to look like me on this earth. That is what God is inviting us towards. But we need to die. We need to say, Lord, everything, everything. I give you everything, Lord. Whatever you want, whatever your will, let it be done. Let it be done in Jesus' name. So I had a quote this week in a sermon where the guy said, and I just feel it's so applicable to, to the sermon. And, and the guy said, what happens when you throw a Christian that's on fire in the fire? Nothing. What happens when you throw a lukewarm Christian in the fire? Everything. <laughs> Ouch. See, when we have a heart that's on fire for God, and God takes us through pruning, and God takes us through the fire, and He takes us through persecution, and He takes us through trials and tribulations, what will our heart be? Our heart will be, Lord, have your way. Lord, may your kingdom come. Lord, yours be the glory forever and ever. Amen. What's our reaction when we're lukewarm? What's our reaction when we're not surrendered? What's our reaction when we haven't died to ourselves? It's like, Lord, why? Lord, why is this happening to me? Lord, why me? Lord, why not someone else? Lord, why when is this going to happen? Lord, how long must I still wait? Lord, how long till this takes place? And all that reactions is our flesh. All those reactions are our selfish desires, our wills for our life. Lord, I wanted to do this this year. Lord, I wanted to accomplish that. And the Lord's like, it's not about what you want to accomplish. It's about me and my glory. And that's God's heart to say, live a life surrendered to me. And your life will be forever changed. Forever changed. So, in conclusion, what I, what I want to, to leave us with is, don't wish the season to pass that God has placed you in. Whoever is hearing this message, what I want to say to you is, don't wish the season to pass that God has placed you in. Secondly, desire God above your comfort. Desire God above your comfort. Desire Him with everything in your heart. With everything, no matter what He does, no matter what He asks. And believe me, your life will never be the same. It's the, it's the best thing that can happen to your life. It's the most amazing thing that can happen in your life. You see, we, we say God is our exceedingly and great reward. What does that mean when we say that? It means that God can take everything away. Everything away. And if we can just have His presence, it's enough. It's a heart that says, Lord, I'm not going if you do not go with me. I will not move if you do not move. I will not turn left if you do not tell me to turn left. And that's a heart to say, Lord, your presence is our exceedingly and great reward. So what is your reward for living a life surrendered to God? More of God. Your reward for living a life surrendered to God is more of God. 
And that's amazing. <laughs> and if that's not amazing to you, then I don't know why you want to go to heaven. <laughs> if that's not amazing to you, then I don't know why you want to go to heaven. Because going to heaven is going to be amazing. Why? Because we're going to be in the presence of God. And the last thing that I want to say is, and if this all maybe seems so much, and it seems like a massive standard, and you're like, Tony, you expect too much of people. Why do you expect so much of everyone? Um, just say it softly, um, make it nice, make it feel good. To try and make it a lit, little bit more simpler. So I want to say, seek God as in his kingdom and the rest will follow. Seek God and his kingdom and the rest will follow. So it starts with a desire. Because so I want you to ask yourself, do you have a desire for God? Do you have a desire to see God's will in your life and not your own? And if your answer is yes, I want to say, keep on seeking God. Keep on seeking his will. The rest will fall in place. Stop keeping your eyes on all the other things that are going on around you. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, and he will guide you and his kingdom will come because your eyes and your heart is for his kingdom. Let us pray. So Lord, I just thank you, Father God, for, for who you are. I thank you that there's no one like you. I thank you, Lord, that, that you are amazing. I thank you, Lord, that that being in relationship with you, Father God, is the best thing on earth. There is nothing that can compare, there is nothing that is greater than being in relationship with you. And Father God, I just ask that, that you will use this message, Lord, not to make people feel condemned, but to make them feel strengthened, to make them feel invited into your presence, to make them feel invited by you, Lord. But I just declare in Jesus' name that if there are people that have not made the decision to die to themselves, if they have not made a decision to fully commit unto you with everything in their hearts, that today will be the day. That today will be the day in Jesus' name. So if that is you this morning, if you are there this morning and you're listening to this message and you say, Dani, whoever is asking, I have not fully committed my life to Christ. And maybe you have in the past, but it's time for a recommitment. It's time to get things straight. If that is you, I want you to lift up your hand or to stand up. It's not something that you hide. I want you to do it that other people can see what you're doing this morning. To say, here I am. No more, no more lukewarm. No more lukewarm Christian. No more half-heartedness. No more one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. From this moment on, I will say, Lord, have your way. Lord, may your kingdom come in my life and in the life of those around me. Lord, I desire to live a life in you. If that is you, just stand up or raise your hand. Give a shout if you need to give a shout. And say, that is me this morning. And Lord, I just thank you for every person that has responded to this, Lord. And I declare in Jesus' name that you meet them where they are. I thank you, Lord, that you see their hearts. And I thank you, Lord, that there will be no shame for what they have done in Jesus' name. I declare that shame, you are broken and you will die down to the feet of the, feet of the cross in the name of Jesus. Shame, you will leave the room right now. I thank you, Lord, that they are in your presence and they are molded in you and they are comforted by you and they are surrounded by you i thank you lord that there where they stand there where they sit lord that your presence will just come upon them lord just come and fill their hearts in jesus name just come and fill them with you lord i just thank you lord for for a moment with you that they've not had before that you are showing them something new right now in jesus name i thank you for that lord In Jesus' name. And yes, Lord, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you that there's no one like you. I thank you, Lord, that we can seek you with everything in our hearts, without turning back or looking aside. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I just thank you for listening to this message this morning. 
Um, if you responded to that call this morning to say you want to live a life desired to God, um, if there are people that are currently watching this with you, I would like you to pray with them. If you are watching this alone, I would like you to send someone a message and say, listen, this is the decision I've made this morning. Will you please pray for me? Will you please pray with me? Will you please walk this road with me? You are not called to walk this road alone. So enjoy the rest of your Sunday. May God bless you. May we grow in our desires for God. May we live to see his kingdom come on this earth, in our town, in our country, and in this world. We, I, just, yeah, I just have such a desire that God's kingdom will come. And we will, as Christians, will rise up and say, Lord, here we are. We want to do what you want to do and not what we want to do. In Jesus' name, amen.